Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Vice President of Technical Leadership Projects and Special Projects at Chapaigo, Dr. Ron McGarrick. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Ron McGarrick, the Vice President for Technical Leadership at Chapaigo, uh, which is an affiliate of Johns Hopkins located in uh, Baltimore. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, acknowledge and thank GBC for recognizing the importance of family planning and for uh, having this session uh, on the program. It is, it is uh, all of us who've worked in family planning for many years much appreciate that. It's really a special honor for me to introduce our session, a Best Buy for Global Health Family Planning. Family planning has been a passion of mine for over 30 years from my initial visits to Kenya and Nigeria in 1978, where I recognize how family planning plays a critical and crucial role in improving the lives of women and their families. Chapaigo has been at the forefront of strengthening family planning and reproductive health programs for 40 years in more than 100 countries around the world. We recently have started major initiatives to scale up postpartum family planning and contraceptive implants, working with the Gates Foundation, USAID, and a number of major corporations in India, Nigeria, Zambia, and elsewhere. We are thrilled to be able to sponsor this session because we know that repositioning and scaling up family planning is integral to the survival of women and their newborns, and it is a good business investment. Yet more than 220 million women and girls around the world still lack access to quality contraception. Meeting this need could help reduce by one-third the number of women who die from pregnancy and childbirth related causes every year and can save millions of children's lives annually. The First Lady of Zambia, Dr. Christine Kaseba Sata, who you've heard earlier about the, her passion for family planning and reproductive health, can truly attest to the importance of family planning in keeping mothers alive and healthy. I had the personal pleasure of working with Dr. Kaseva Sata while she was chairman of the Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics at University Teaching Hospital in Lusaka when she helped the government of Zambia roll out quality family planning services nationwide. Dr. Babatundi Osotamane the executive director of UNFPA has long been a champion of family planning. While as Nigeria's Minister of Health, he set in motion two critical policy changes, removing user fees for family planning commodities in Nigeria and providing for the first time a budget line item for the procurement of contraceptives, contraceptives two uh, uh, criti critical things that he did. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished session moderator, someone who has a tremendous passion and commitment to family planning, Kathy Calvin, President and CEO of the UN Foundation and co-chair of the Reproductive Health Pillar of the MDG Health Alliance. Kathy, and thank you very much. Good morning, thank you, Ron, and congratulations Gary, Ray, and the whole GBC Health team, thank you for putting the first panel of the day on this important topic. Reproductive health hasn't been on the agenda here before, but as I hope you leave thinking today, it's a best buy, it's a complete return on investment, and it's something everyone in this room should be helping make happen. Um, I want to point out Angela Mwanza, a native of Zambia, who is my co-chair, is a MDG Health Pillar, for MDG Health Pillar for Reproductive Health, somewhere here in the back. And uh, offer my congratulations also to uh, Her Excellency for that terrific award. I'm glad to have her on this panel. So as I said, we're gonna talk about return on investment. And I was at AOL Time Warner when the GBC was first created a long time ago. And I, I was one of the first members because I believed that it was important for companies to find a way to work together even if it wasn't their core issue to bring all the other asset, assets that they had to the table. And I'm excited to see that GBC Health has continued growing in this direction and I think this is a new avenue for us. 
As you know, today many conversations are focused on how we can reduce child and maternal health and achieve Millennium Development Goals 4 and 5. Well, we think one of the smartest and most effective steps we can take for reaching all the goals, in fact, is to increase support for and investments in voluntary family planning. It's often missing from the global health conversations because, among other things, some people think it's controversial. But as Melinda Gates has told us often, as she made this her primary cause, there should be no controversy. And we know it has genuine consequences. If we can put money into family planning, we can shift many things regarding women's health, and not only their health, but the health of their communities. So I want to put a few slides on the, on the um, screen for you. They come from a brand new book that's at your table that talks about the return on investment and looks at the investment in family planning's impact in four areas, four positive ripple effects for empowering women, saving lives, strengthening economies, and promoting a healthier environment. I don't come to this by myself. Our founder, Ted Turner, who's a longtime advocate of family planning, has made the case that there is no better value for money than international family planning. He says it provides a higher return on investment than almost any other type of development assistance. Now, he's a businessman, and he appreciates facts and numbers, so that's what we've tried to do here. We've gone to many sources, the UN Population Fund, the World Bank, Guttmacher, Reference Bureau, and others for these sorts of data and why it's a best buy. And I want to thank Wagner Edstrom for pu putting this material together. So let's get started. So the first point is just what I've been saying. And then let's look at what those returns are. So the first returns have to do with our, our communities and our economies. We know that one third of the economic growth in Southeast Asia at the end of the last century was attributable to families' ability to plan their the spacing and timing of their families. Education, this is the number one reason often many girls do not stay in school. Our environment, we know that giving people the opportunity to plan and time their families can lower the pressure on our planet. And finally, stability, we know that population is a, is a critical issue in all, all forms of community stability. So talk about a force multiplier for investments that you'll be making in all other areas. This is the start. And then finally, saving lives. And this may be the most important, but I want to put the others first because they're what we talk about. So what are the numbers here? The one I want to call your attention to is that $1 invested in family planning can save up to $9 in other developmental costs for maternal and child health costs, infectious diseases, water, sanitation, and education. So that's why we're here today. It's clear that investments in voluntary family planning can provide a big bang for everybody's buck. We know it's the right thing to do, and now we know it's the smart thing to do. So my two panelists today, who've already been introduced, are experts in this, and I want them to talk to you a little bit now about the way they're thinking about some of these same issues. You know he's been in Nigeria for much of his career, but now is at the UN Population Fund. So you've had the privilege of thinking about this in two ways, and you've seen countries do a lot to change the way that they're putting family planning into their economic planning. What, what's working and what do we need to do more of? Uh, good morning, everybody. And let me thank you, Kathy, and congratulations, Your Excellency. Uh, family planning continues to be that investment which makes a lot of difference to people's lives. And we at UNFPA, we work in 150 countries, two thirds of the world, in terms of providing family planning services. Now, when you talk about the economic value of it, I think it's important to put that into context in, in the kinds of things that we see uh, we know that in Thailand, for instance, for each dollar of uh, we invest in family planning, we get back about $10. In Egypt, it's about $6. Uh, we have a study that we've done in, um, in the Philippines, and it's about $9. So investments in family planning actually gives back to, uh, to the countries and the economies that uh, that invest in it. 
In Nigeria, there was a study that showed that if you are able to reduce fertility by one child, uh, you actually increase the GDP by $13 billion. So it's, it's a big push. Now, but I think that the numbers speak for themselves, but the numbers are not people. What actually matters is that at the end of the day, when we invest in family planning and we give access to women and girls, and universally, not just in terms of urban or some selected group, if we do it universally, and every woman and every girl can make that choice without coercion, what you are doing is liberating energies which either two does not exist. And we know today that if you want Africa, for an example, to reach and to reap the demographic bonus which it is supposed to, to reap in order to move forward, there are two things that we've identified as, as the major issues which must happen. The first is girl education. They must stay in school and family planning is important. And the second is family planning. Family planning, family planning, family planning. <laughs> so being able to release that potential, being able to get girls to stay in school, being able to get women to plan their lives, to choose the number and the gap between the, child, the first child and the other, or not even have a child. They need, uh, they need family planning, and we all have a responsibility to ensure that it is, it is provided. So, in a sense, I think family planning is probably the most important intervention for human development in the world. Thank you. I'm going to come back to some ways that we can work together on this, but I'd like to ask Her, Her Excellency to talk about your experience in Zambia. You spearheaded the commitment that the Zambian government is making for Family Planning 2020, and you've, you've led in a number of ways, including working with the religious leaders. What's your experience been and how we bring this to a full sectoral approach? Uh, I'm glad that uh, Dr. Babatunde actually talked about the importance of education, especially for the girl child. I recently launched um, a campaign to end child marriages and really visiting these homes um, with 15-year-old uh, boys staying in wedlock with an 11-year-old child was really heart-wrenching because what do you expect those two to, to be doing? And we need a lot of support to really be able to get to them, to reach out to them so that they can go back to school, so that they may realize their full potential. And I think it's also important to note that family planning uh, helps break the cycle of poverty. It's been clearly uh, demonstrated that uh, poor families will always have large families. Poor families will not have enough resources to send their children to school. Poor families will not have enough resources to be able to look uh, after the health of their families. And so if we avail family planning to a lot of our poor um, members in our societies, I think we'll help them just make the right move to be able to better look after, the, after themselves. In Zambia, we launched uh, the family planning uh, campaign recently, almost two months ago, because we felt we had to reposition uh, family planning into the agenda. We had to reprioritize family planning in the health agenda. And it's very funny because, you know, during the 1970s, family planning was not at, at, at all anywhere in the development um, agenda of Zambia, as many politicians viewed family planning as a tool uh, by whites to uh, reduce the population of, uh, of African countries. But we, we were lucky, I think, with the assistance of UNFPA, with the assistance of other cooperating partners. In 1996, all this started changing. Previously, there was a backlog of uh, very high fertility rates, very high maternal mortality rates, very high infant uh, and uh, neonatal rates, and very low uh, primary school retention. But in 1996, this changed. 
because people started refocusing uh, on family planning and it, you know, the attitude started changing. We had a lot of meets uh, on Depo Provera um, and at one time Depo Provera was actually banned in Zambia. But from 1996 this changed. We had a lot of funds coming in but suddenly HIV came on the scene and all the interests shifted to HIV. And what happened? We started going back to the pre-1996 indicators. Our maternal mortality ratios started going up. Currently in Zambia, maternal mortality is about 591 per 100,000 live births, and our infant mortality rates are very high at about 96 per 1,000 live births. This is really very high compared to uh, developed uh, countries and we've had to rethink. There have been a lot of interventions. We, there's been a lot of campaigns to drive the girls to go to school, positive affirmation to have girls go to school, but our maternal mortality ratios have still remained relatively high. So we had to rethink and appraise the interventions that we had and go back to the drawing board. So we now have a roadmap, and thanks to the wonderful summit that was held in, uh, in London, uh, hosted by Melinda Gates, uh, UNFPA, and DFID, where resources were mobilized, we were able to go back to the drawing board and come up, identify the barriers that contribute to women not accessing family planning. And it was really wonderful to see government making commitments and pledges to increase a budgetary allocation to commodity, to ensure commodity security. Previously, 90% of all our commodities were being procured by donor agencies and cooperating partners. But I'm very proud to sit here and say, you know, the government has increased, has doubled uh, the budgetary allocation to health and is actually committed uh, to mobilizing more resources, just going specifically to ensure commodity security. In our roadmap, uh, we've also identified certain actors that we think are very key to making a difference. We have, ad we have identified the traditional leaders as well as um, the, tra the traditional uh, leaders in our society and as well as the religious groups who have been an impediment in the, the family planning agenda. Zambia, I think about 60% are Catholics, and you know the stand of Catholics, so it's been very difficult. We've had instances of uh, certain hospitals who have been supported by Catholics actually being banned, or members attending that, um, members uh, found to have uh, taking contraceptive uh, methods to being banned from attending the hospitals as well as being banned and excommunicated from the churches. So we had to engage the traditional leaders and the religious leaders. And it's been really wonderful to come together, sit together and see, identify opportunities and niches where each key stakeholder would have a part. We have now agreed that uh, religious leaders will continue spreading the good word of God. They will continue talking about abstinence. They will continue doing what they know best. But if that fails, we have agreed that they should let other stakeholders uh, to take up the, from where they are, they are failed. So it's really comprehensive and uh, holistic, and we are very excited. We are also excited because um, Zambia has a deficit of uh, health workers, and we've had to identify task shifting to non-medical um, staff and we've had to identify community health workers to help us in availing contraceptive so that we can increase the access to contraceptive. So the roadmap contains quite a lot of uh, bold and innovative uh, approaches in a bid to make a difference, in a bid to be able to move from where we are to 59% in seven years. Fantastic. Thank you. So that's a great picture from one country where a lot can be done, where there's a lot of room for new partnerships. Papa Tundi, talk about the, the way you see these multi-stakeholder multi partnerships. We've, we clearly have one in Every Woman, Every Child, the Secretary General's initiative for maternal and child health. We have one in Family, 20, Family Planning 2020, which you were leading with the Gates Foundation. How do these business leaders think about becoming part of those movements? 
Thank you very much, Kathy. I Let me also add one or two uh, um, examples, because I think that uh, when we see multi-country examples and we see how uh, um, different regions of the world are dealing with family planning, it gives us uh, new insights into what to do. I visited uh, Kingston, Jamaica, sometime last year, and the Prime Minister uh, showed me a project which she was doing where adolescent girls who were pregnant were looked after and uh, taken through that pregnancy, but nurtured after that to go back to school, and they provided them family planning. So it's, it's not the end of the world for those girls. They also then, you know, provide them, you know, that opportunity to reach their full potential because I think it's an important uh, thing. Now, what she's done subsequently is to try and now make that public policy. Mm. So if you get pregnant and you're an adolescent, you are, you know, going to be encouraged to have the child but then go back to school so that you can have skills because if you do not have enough resources to look after yourself and your child, you are going to perpetuate poverty. And, and I think uh, it was one example that struck me, and I thought that was, uh, and that, was, that was a very good example. The point that I'm making here is that the frontier to make change happen in family planning is with the young or married woman. That's where we're going to have to work together to do this. Now, let me now come back to your question. How can we use uh, the business community to, to move this agenda forward? The UNFPA uh, would like to work with you, first of all, to identify innovative marketing techniques to reach young people. One of the things we know, and she talked, and the Excellency talked about it to, Iver, to some extent, but to a larger extent in the world is that young people do not go to the public places where they will be judged. They don't go there. They would rather talk to their peers. They will go to youth-friendly services. But actually, the great opportunity that we have now is we have social media. We have ICT technology. We can actually liberalize the space and try to provide information and provide uh, education and actually linkages to youth-friendly services and make sure that those youth-friendly services are well-stocked and each one of those steps has technologies and innovation that can go with it. And so I challenge uh, the business community to go along with us to help us design those uh, new spaces free spaces for young people to be able to do that. That's the first. The second, I think, is that we have not uh, paid, we have not done a lot of research and development into new uh, products for a long time. I think business has to go back, not only in terms of uh, the chemistry itself, but also in terms of uh, the innovations that go with packaging, the innovations that go with distribution. Uh, and, and finally, one of the things we've done in UNFPA, which is working very well for us, is that we also have uh, worked with UPS, for instance, to begin to see how they can help strengthen country distribution systems. Because if you cannot get to the last mile, then you cannot provide universal access. And, and you know, um, the, the, uh, the companies there and the private sector, you already have sunk costs in, this, in these areas. You are, it's, not, it's not new for you. So you can help countries and national systems to design those and, and also make sure that uh, that, that happens. Uh, and let me, uh, maybe I said finally, but there's another finally. Um, we are working with Intel to, to actually produce modules, training modules for health workers. And so, so that we can ramp up quite, quite uh, significantly. Uh, the first lady talked about 
using community health workers, we have produced modules with, it, with Intel to actually be able to teach people about things you know, in kind of remote distance learning systems. And I think those are very, very specific things that I believe the private sector can do. Now, finally, finally, <laughs> after the, uh, after the, uh, after the uh, family planning summit last year, we worked with two big companies uh, producing family planning, and they've reduced cost considerably. And I think, you know, Bayer uh, is, the, is the last one. They've actually brought back the cost of implants to make sure that, you know, we can get to many more people. And I think those are specific areas that I believe the private sector can work with us. Great ways we can work together, whether it's supply chain. If, if I but just please go ahead. to say, so I also to just uh, quickly add on, I know that the business community has really done very well in terms of uh, workplace uh, programs for HIV, for malaria, and so on. And my appeal would then be to ask them to integrate family planning into the existing uh, HIV places, to integrate other reproductive health um, you know, services like cancer screening into the existing HIV planning. And I'm sure you're going to reap a lot of benefits from just integration. First and foremost, uh, you will reduce the stigma uh, that goes with the uh, HIV uh, clinic because then they will become reproductive health clinics. And people will not be afraid to be coming to have themselves tested because they can easily tell somebody, oh, I, you know, I went uh, to access uh, family planning. And even for HIV, I think one of the prongs that has not really been looked at is meeting the unmet need for HIV positive um, uh, patients uh, on family planning. So you will be able to give and access information as well as services to a lot of people and you will have a happy workforce. And I'm sure a lot of women will come and thank you. There's nothing that is really more satisfying uh, to a, an employer but than, than to have a very satisfied and committed person because productivity will go up. So I really ask you to integrate. You will reap more benefits. A lot of people who will be absenting themselves going to uh, get services elsewhere, you know, spending a lot of uh, necessary time which they would have spent in uh, uh, being productive. Will, the services will be brought closer to them and they'll be able to, to be happy and get services. And I think it's also important that you help government as well in uh, service delivery. One of the innovations we're looking at is bringing services closer to women. We've realized in uh, Africa that women never have time for themselves. They would never go and get uh, services because their main concern is putting food on the table. Their main concern is looking after the children and raising enough money to send their children to school. So they never have time. They wake up very in the early wee hours of the morning trying to go and find some trade. They are marketeers. And if we could help in getting the services even closer to them at the markets where they are, then we will make a difference because then our contraceptive prevalence rates will go up. So that's an excellent additional point on the many ways that companies, whether in the, they're in the pharmaceutical industry or frankly many others, can be valuable assets and partners in this effort to reduce, uh, unmet, the, reduce the unmet need and to make sure that women and men have access to voluntary family planning when they want it, the services, the education, and the opportunities. So we've talked about what the, what the industries can do. What is it that this will do for industries? You, you just led into that by saying it will create a much more diverse workforce because we'll see more women able to stay in the workforce. We'll see more women in uh, the supply chain. Every, I think everybody in this auditorium is probably thinking about how to improve women's economic empowerment in all the countries they're investing in. What else can we be thinking about in terms of the benefits back to the companies from playing in this particular role? I, I think that um, I, I go back in history and I think about what we, we did in Nigeria when we started family planning, which was, uh, as uh, Excellency said, was pre-HIV. Uh, pre, um, pre 
And what we did at the time was to take family planning out of clinical spaces. And we went and took it to the communities. In taking it to the communities, we actually created a market-based distribution system in which circumstance women did not have to move from their, their market stalls or whatever they were doing to be able to access family planning. Now, I think that the uptake of family planning will go up if we, if we go back to that. But in doing that, we would also ensure that the private sector will benefit tremendously from greater attention to the markets and people would be able to do far more than they were doing before. It also ensures that the uptake of family planning in going up stimulates production. i give you an example. After or just around the time we were planning the London summit, we were looking at what we have to do to uh, guarantee uh, production for, uh, uh, for our, our partners, uh, our corporate partners. And Pfizer at the time told us, Pfizer at the time, and still now, is the major producer of Depot Provera. Pfizer told us that they would need to have some projection of at least five, 10 years for them to increase their production capacity. Now, if we ramp up considerably, if we're able to rank, ramp up uptake of family planning and people are able to do what they have to do, then of course, Pfizer will have the confidence right. and we would have the confidence to give the volume guarantees for them to go back and do what they have to do. And I, and I think that that is one major, major uh, part of, of this. Now, and of course, uh, uh, as we know, the more people take it, and the more popular it gets, uh, the, better, the better it is, discrimination goes, and, and you actually get liberalization. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put up one last slide that is what you can do. And that's really been the focus of this panel and these two excellent uh, speakers. You know, I think uh, for years this was always seen as, well, this is the government's role. Maybe some nonprofits were working in this space. But I think what you're hearing is we think we can't do it without you. And we can't do it without your assets and without your commitment and your ability to shape public opinion in your communities and to talk to your employees. So we wanted to make the case that this is not just a return for women and their families, but also for your businesses, for our economies, and for our planet. So I'd like to issue a small call to action here at the end on behalf of my two panelists. And that is that by the time we reach the end of 2015, when the first phase of the Millennium Development Goals will be coming to an end and we'll be moving on to the second phase of our development agenda, that we have five more companies from all kinds of different sectors joining us in trying to broaden the conversation on family planning, showing us some new ways to drive behavior change, demand, and in in implementation and inclusion in the community of these critical services and tools. I think with more of our working together and making this genuinely a multi-sector approach, we can make a real difference in saving women's lives and improving our economies. I want to thank everybody for thinking about this with us. Um, the UN Foundation, UN Population Fund, and of course all these great leaders in Africa would welcome working with you. So thank you all very much for being with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much.